All right, we're at the round table tonight at Calvary Assembly, so why don't we bow our heads and uh, we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the treasure of your word. We pray your richest blessing upon our study tonight. I pray that you would protect those out, outdoors right now traveling in this rain and protect us even as we uh, leave after our time together. I pray that our time would be well spent here tonight in your word, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, we're in Ephesians, and we're going we're gonna to open with a lot of drama because there's a lot of women in this room, and the opening line says, Wives, submit to your husbands. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, so I'm hoping nobody brought rotten fruit with them to throw. Uh, oh, yeah, an announcement. Uh, you all know about QR codes, right? Uh, everybody's in this electronic age. You can give. You uh, take a picture, basically, of this or focus it in on your camera, and then this will take you directly to our PayPal, and you can give online here at Calvary. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 22, let the drama unfold. But remember, what we're talking about here is God's expectations on us once we get saved. In other words, we have turned from our dark ways of living. We're turning into the marvelous light of Christ. And he says, welcome. This is a life that we're now going to live together. And he said in the, the verse prior, that we are going to submit to one another in the fear of God. So first and foremost, wives are not the only ones submitting. Everyone is submitting to somebody. Uh, how many of you have an employer? You have to submit to the wants of your, uh, your, your employer, right, as an employee. Or if you are in a circumstance of uh, hierarchy of any kind, a, a volunteer group, there's a hierarchy there, and somebody is kind of telling you what to do. What is the natural reaction of humans when they're told what to do? Yeah, we're, we just, I, yeah, we're rebellious. I said last week, repugnant, nasty people. Someone tells us what to do. We're already thinking 10,000 other things that we're going to do, right, in the face of instruction. So this is a hard one because the Bible is telling us when we, we turn to Christ, he's the boss. God is the boss, and he says, submit to one another. Uh, and that can be in any way, shape, or form. Uh, for an example, when, when I learned CPR, one of the first things that the person who comes upon someone unconscious is supposed to do is look around and say, someone call 911. That is a direct order to people standing around not facilitating. See the drama of all this? <laughs> and so that is a direct order that one human being is giving across to other human beings. Now, if our first response is, I'm not calling 911, who are you to tell me what to do? All sorts of things like that. Someone's life is over. Right, Because we're going to attempt CPR, but CPR is only a temporary fix for something that could be a, a little bit of longer of duration. So until the paramedics get there, we need someone doing CPR and someone... So we, we've got to get down to those basics. That it is so important to God how we live that it's almost life and death. And I don't know if I got that across strong enough... Uh, to us when we were talking out of Hebrews, that this fear of God sense that if we don't turn to him and stay living for him, the fear of hell looms. And I know that's kind of a scary prospect, that if we say we live for God, but in reality we don't, hell awaits. But if we turn to God and live for God, that's a different situation altogether. So I think a lot of people hang their life on the salvation prayer they make and then never live for God, and that's not where it's at. Because if you are truly sorry for what you've done, you turn away from wicked living, and you turn to the ways of God. And so these are, these are some instructions we're supposed to follow when it comes to following God. So submitting to one another, and then after he says submit to one another, the first instance that he gives is one of marriage. 
And he says in verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands. But it does, there's not a period there. There's a comma. And then it says, as to the Lord. So, uh, I say this across the board. Always look for Christ in someone else. In other words, in every relationship that you are in, and in this case, he's, he's speaking to women, saying whether you're married or you're going to get married or whatever the case may be, when you are married, you don't look at your husband in the eyes of flesh. You see him as though God. Not that he is God. Don't, don't confuse it. Uh, and men kind of can let that go to their heads. See, I'm God. You have to submit to everything I say. Now calm down there, buddy. It's, it's not about that. You, you're, you're seeing through the lens that he is created in the image of God, and you respect God, therefore you respect this individual. And if he tells you something, um, we do have to get down to personality types now. There are some men that are just very bossy. They have a lot of expectations, and they just start spouting them off. Now, is that, do we have to directly respond to all of that? That is a, a good question. So I would say that there is a need for, a, for some sort of marital counseling at that point. Because this is not about a man just dictating. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And the wife saying, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. That, that is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a relationship where there is love, there's companionship, dare I say teamwork, that we're working towards the same goals, raising a family, raising a household, uh, being financially responsible. Uh, I know that there's a lot of times that um, I've raised a lot of girls in my home. Uh, we, we only got two boys. We got Baron and um, little Johnny back there. The rest are all women in my house. And there is sometimes a lot of uh, expectations for, for dad to spend a lot of money. And I would say to each one of my daughters, oh boy, you better marry up. Um, because if you want this, 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 and you carry on into the rest of your life, you're, you're what I would call expensive. <laughs> and so... When you get married to a guy that doesn't meet all of those financial expectations and you have a certain set of expectations and it doesn't match, it's already number the, the number one reason why couples fight is over money, right? So we got to boil this thing down to say uh, money comes over time usually if it's done correctly and, in, and wise investments and Earning potential will grow over the span of your life. When you're young and in your teens and 20s, that's not the maximum potential for most careers unless you're a celebrity or a, a, an elite athlete. Those careers start with millions of dollars young, and I can't tell you how many of those people have wasted millions of dollars in wild living, and then they end up broke. So there is always a need, no matter how much money you make, for a conversation to say, are we on the same team here? Are we, do we share the same goals and are we moving forward? And if you have the same goals, submitting to uh, a wife saying to her husband, give me this, buy me that, and he says to her, no. That's not a reason to fight. He's defending the checkbook. You understand what I'm saying? So you both have to be in on the conversation to say, uh, it's not always the women. Sometimes the guy is the spender, and the wife has to say, knock it off. <laughs> You're spending our retirement here. Um, you can't do that. So that's what submitting looks like. It looks like conversation. It looks like a lot of dialogue. It looks like we're on the same team trying to accomplish the same goals. Are you all with me? So if we are in that set of circumstances, submitting isn't a problem. But whenever we have disassociation, we have two separate set of goals, people aren't going in the right direction together, submitting looks like an awful, laborious set of circumstances. 
And again, this is one that I have to tread lightly with couples because you might have one of them saved and one of them's not saved. And they want to say, but the Bible says, look, this is rough because you have an unbeliever here in the house and scripture would say you're unequally yoked. And if you look at that agricultural example, you have a strong ox on one side and a weak ox on the other. It's going to be out of balance at all times when they're trying to drag the cart. Am I making sense to you all? So that's what unequally yoked. One is weak, one is strong. So um, you have to take every circumstance and not just throw this verse at it. And a, a husband can't just say, you're supposed to submit. Uh, because the wives could come back with some following verses that we're about to look at too. Because we're going to go from wives to husband to children. Everyone is involved. The whole family is involved. And the whole picture of the family is one of a family that follows God together. All right? Um, I can't tell you how many families out there, they're, they're saved, they go to church, uh, two or three kids, two of them are following the Lord, and you got one, ain't doing it. You can't force that one that's not following what the rest of the family is doing. All you can do is live Scripture in front of them. Are you all with me? So I do, I do not want to throw this set of scriptures and say, everybody must, and you do it with an iron fist. Every bit of this is done with diplomacy and negotiation strategies with the goal in mind of lead, leading people to Christ. That is the objective of these verses. Any thoughts, questions? Bob? Yeah, you know, um, Steph and I have had these discussions. We've been married for 30 They're almost 39. 39 years. Mm -hmm. And we've got some other folks probably been married for quite a while. And, and you know, I, I would talk to young people, people. Gee, how do you guys stay married so long? Well, we've learned that, that my wife wants me and I want to love God more than I love her. Now, the hard part is we're the husbands because we get, I want to be the king of the house. And here's where we learn to submit. When we pray and we desire that our wives come to love God more than they love what she loves me. Right. And so now we begin the submission process of the male. Right. And, and that, that helps out. So that's the key to a successful marriage. Yeah. Each one of you love God more than the other. Yeah. More than your spouse. Right. And so um, for a tangible example, um, Johnny and Savannah are very much at that age. They're six years old, almost turning seven, and they, they mimic almost to a T everything that Tammy and I say and do, both good and bad. And for the good, we're like, yay! For the bad, we're like, ooh! <laughs> oh, how embarrassing. So, um, but we're modeling, right? My point is, is that we're modeling. So if we as parents are modeling for them, um, who is our model? And like you're saying, our Heavenly Father is our model. We're trying to live a life of submission. So did Christ submit? Absolutely. He submitted largely his life to pay for the penalty of our sin. He submitted to the Roman government of execution when he didn't have to. He's the Son of God. Some Roman soldier puts his hand on God. I mean, he had, remember the woman who touched the hem of his garment and was healed? Does he not have the power to do just the opposite? That if a Roman soldier puts his hands on Jesus, cannot power flow out of him and electrocute him <laughs> and put him down? Like, don't touch me again, punk. Like that type of stuff. Like, Jesus didn't do that. He put aside divinity, as it were, to become sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God through him. So he is the perfect example of willing submission. Now, for a good per person, someone might willingly die, Romans says. But for an unjust person, who would ever die? Right? Isn't that what Romans talks about? Jesus didn't just die for the just. He died for the unjust. 
ones that thoroughly do not deserve it. So you want to talk about someone that submitted his life in entirety, it was Jesus Christ. So he's our model. He's the one we're looking to to say, how do we do this? Well, we have to become like children. Our little kids follow our every examples as it relates to vocabulary, song choices, food choices, everything about their life. They're mimicking us. We have to do the same. All right, God, we don't know how to do this spiritual life. We're young. We're children. Teach us how to do this. And he says it's done like this. And uh, quietness is how Jesus did it. There were accusations thrown at him by the Roman government, by witnesses, and he opened not his mouth. He was led like a sheep to slaughter. He didn't say a word. I mean, I can't tell you how many times accusations have been said about me, and I want to, yeah, I want to throat punch. I want to I wanna state my case, but I've learned from my father-in-law, bite your tongue. It should look like Swiss cheese. There should be holes in your tongue, biting your tongue, saying, I'm not going to say anything. Let them have accusations. Our model, Christ said, when they say stuff about you, just let it roll off. Oh, is that hard? But that's what submission looks like. Submission looks like, look, I'm, he's my defender. I'm going to let him defend me. If I've done wrong, so be it. I'll face those circumstances. But if I've done right and I've been accused of wrong, then God will vindicate me. He's our defender, right? So we roll with it. That's what submission looks like. Uh, the next line, verse 23, for the husband, it's describing his role. The husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So Paul didn't say this, but I like saying this. It, husbands, if you want to be the head of your household and be respected by your wife, live for her and die for her. And she'll respect you all day long, right? If you're willing to live for her and you're willing to put your life on the line for her, I don't think women will have a problem submitting to that kind of relationship. But if you're going to be abusive and you're going to look down your nose at her as a second-class citizen and you're going to talk poorly about her and to her, that's not Christ-like. The Christ-like example is Jesus lived for the church. He developed this church. He is the cornerstone of the church. He is the foundation of the church by which everything that is built up out of it remain strong. If a husband will be all of those things, I don't think the wife has any problem submitting. What I have watched in my generation, um, I am a generation Xer. I fall into this category. We were the, the, um, the number one uh, generation in, in most of our history leading up to Gen X of one parent families. That is, divorce heavily affected from the previous generation. There wasn't a whole lot of divorce, but our parents, it's almost common. You talk to anybody that was in my, my generation, our parents aren't together. It, your story is, like, very unique. Most people who are my parents' age have been divorced, if not once, several times over. And so when you look at that, you see a generation that put not a lot of emphasis on marriage. And so you have kids like my generation. We grow up and we read verses like this. We've never seen submission modeled. Uh, my dad was a good guy. He's a good guy. My mom was a good, good woman. They could not get along. Their, their marriage ended, and I did not have a model to grow up under. How many of you are in the same boat? You don't have a model for that, right? So we read verses like this. We're like, I got no, no model for that. And so the only model left for us is what's here. As Christ is the head of the church. So when we come to this church, a lot of people say, oh, I want to come to your church, Pastor Kevin. 
This is not my church. He lets me preach in it. And I have to move around so I don't get struck by lightning. <laughs> like, he is a holy God, and I would never take his place to say that this is my church. Uh, we throw that language around. Uh, Andy Stanley, how many of you know him? Popular, right? Popular guy out of Atlanta. A lot of people say, oh, you want to go by Andy Stanley's church? Uh, no, you don't. <laughs> if it's run by Andy Stanley, that's no good. But Andy Stanley preaches, and it's Christ's church, right? Do you understand? And he is a great communicator, don't get me wrong, but it's not his church. So we got to get it straight. Christ is the head of the church. He is the boss by which everything else submits underneath. And if we can understand that, that's how a household by design is supposed to work. So if I could be an advocate for marriage, and I am, I am actually uh, one of the counselors licensed down at the, the courthouse here when young couples are about to get married, they say to young couples, look, if you get marriage counseling, we'll take $100 off of your, your license. And every young couple's like, oh, really? Um, where do we go? Well, there's a list of people that you can go to, and I'm on that list. So my phone rings a lot. Young couples want to come here, and they want to get counseling. And I say to every one of them, oh, you don't want to get married. And they're like, we came here for counseling. I'm like, yep, I'm telling you, you don't want to do it. It's an awful predicament. You really don't want to do this. And they're like, they're very confused. I thought you were a counselor. Oh, I am. I'm giving you wise counsel. You do not want to do this. Half of these things fail. This is a 50-50 shot. You sure you want to do this? And then I make them start defending <clears throat> why they want to do this. And if they are successful in defending themselves, I will continue. If they can't defend their marriage before they get married, there's no hope. This thing is headed for divorce. And it takes them right out of starry Valentine's Day to, oh my God. This is work, and this is reality. And so when I do this with a young couple, I'm trying to make them understand there's a right way that a marriage is supposed to work. And uh, we're not being sexist, but God has put the man at the headship of the church. Um, I want to go back to my household. I grew up with my mother, absent a father role. My mother had to become both. Does anyone else have that experience? You had to have a mother that had to be both. Um, that is very strenuous on them, I just want to say. I know that my mother trying to raise two boys who were rambunctious and disobedient and everything else and crazy, that's why she had a belt over her shoulders at all times. Like, uh, she could hit us with that sucker pretty good or a shoe or whatever other instrument was nearby. But the point was, I could see it later in, in her life, the stress. Um, she aged quickly. Um, she is in full Alzheimer's, as you see now. And I think all of the stress in her life kind of adds up to this. And I look at that and say, that isn't how it was supposed to be. My mother shouldn't have had to raise us boys. I mean, we chose to be with her uh, because of the circumstances, but it was, that's not God's design. Single parenting on either side is not God's design. He has a role for husbands, and he has a role for wives, and they're both very important for the child-rearing aspect. All right, that's, uh, I know it's weird, but that's why adoptive parents and foster parents in a system where people end up losing their children, the state recognizes children need stable adults in their life. And that's why there's a foster program and eventually an adoption program, because kids need stability. All right, does everybody understand where I'm going? So this, this is not sexist by any stretch. God just says, look, I put the man in charge to kind of guide how things go in a marriage and, and in family. Mm 
Right. Where the, where the husband represents the high priest Jesus. Yeah, there. And the wife represents the church. The Holy Spirit. Right. The church. And both equal parts of the same body. They're equal. Yeah. So the sexism thing is just gone. Yeah, this is not about sexist at all. This is about roles. If you have a job and you have a job, if you guys come together and do your job, it's going to work out great. But if this one tries to do yeah, that role and that one's also trying to do that role, well, nobody's doing this role. And that causes all kind of chaos, as it were. So uh, before we you know, think it's all about praising the men, it says in the next verse, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So again, I reiterate that if the husband is living this way, the wife has no problem submitting to that type of leadership. That here's a husband who's going to love his wife. Um, it, it is funny that husbands are commanded to love their wives. But you'll notice here it didn't say anything about wives loving their husbands. Now why is that? Does anyone want to venture a guess why wives don't have to be told to love their husbands? <laughs> Careful, you're like one of three guys in a room, four guys in a room. Yeah. What's that? True, that's true. But um, I, I would say, and I'm not trying to be sexist here, I think women are generally born to love. As the one that gives birth to children, I've not seen very many pictures of women who disdain that which they've just given birth to. There is a natural inclination to put that baby on your chest and love. And, and that's across the, the board, except there's a few mammals that God created that will eat their young or, <laughs> or whatever. It's just strange when it comes to some mammals and insects. But in the human... <laughs> In the human condition, most, most women will love automatically. Um, guys, uh, we don't, we're not born with that. We are born for respect. You walk into any room full of guys, it's not based on giving hugs to each other and cuddling. There's no blankets in a room full of guys. that We, we don't get under blankets and watch movies together. There's... <laughs> There's just none of that. I, I, I know. But guys, we are wired for respect. And it is fun to watch, ladies. If you ever want to watch how males work, just, just watch a group of them. And a, a hierarchy will be determined very quickly. Uh, the guy that hits the hardest, either physically or with his words. Most guys start their conversations by insulting other guys in the room. I don't know why. That's just the way it works. I'll give you, for instance, Ron, with his guitar, walked in, and he had a bag with him that he was carrying, and it, I'll say it looked feminine, don't you think, Bob? Oh, yeah, yeah and, and <laughs> his bag looked on the feminine side, and so uh, Bob's... <laughs> Bob said to Ron, uh, your wife is so nice. And uh, Ron said, what are you talking about? She let you borrow her purse <laughs> <laughs> to come to church. That's guys. I mean, Bob nails it. That's how guys cooperate. Now, ladies, you want to get married to one of these, right? All he knows is insulting. And if you, if you actually go down to the, the middle school, even elementary, and watch boys that like girls, they will kick them, punch them, <laughs> throw things at them, and they're trying to say, I like you. I like you. And the girl's like, that's, that's not how we receive love. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So you see the dilemma. 
boys are already doing what they do at a young age, and so are girls, you know, giggling, and, and they have their blankets and their TV watching going on, and the boys are throwing stuff at them, and it's just like, we've got work to do. Because one day they're going to grow up, and if no one tells, look, you've got to respect him, and he has to love you. And the comedy channel is on up in heaven from that point forward. Like, watch this unfold. Watch this marriage unfold because he has to love her and she has to learn how to respect him. And that's marriage. I'm telling you, that's marriage in a nutshell. If you work on that consistently, you've got a lot of work to do right there, right, off, right out of the gate. But if you can figure it out, and there are a lot of couples that have, um, that is the secret whether they know it or not. Some people don't even know they figured out the secret. But the, they figured out that if I can love her in spite of all the things that I think are strange or different or difficult about her, and I still love her, you're going to be successful. And if she figures out how to speak to him in the Neanderthal that he is, um, she's figured it out. I know how to talk to him. I know how to give him respect. And he loves it. He thrives off of it. And the more I respect him, the more he loves me. Does that make sense? So it's not manipulating. It's learning your job description and carrying it out to a T. If you do, you're highly successful in this stuff called relationship. But a lot of couples never figure this out. Uh, I always bring this up in marriage counseling if a couple makes it that far. And then I al always ask them, can I read this passage at your wedding? And almost to a T, even couples that aren't Christian will say to me, we want you to do our wedding, and will you read that passage you taught us in marriage counseling at our, our wedding? That's right. That's what we're going to do. So exciting, right? This, this, this works across the board. Verse 26, the reason why he loves the wife, uh, loved the, as Christ loves the church, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the word. This is what Bob was speaking of just a moment ago, that the, the husband is the priest of the home. He is responsible largely for the religious teachings that happen at home. It is the, the man's job to read scripture with his wife, and it is the man's job, I believe, to read scripture with the children. He is the priest of the home, and you're sanctifying or, or setting apart your marriage to be a godly one and you instill in it preaching in your home. Am I making sense? And so the guys are responsible for this because Christ is responsible for making sure that that sanctification happens in the church. So if you have a marriage where there's no prayer and there's no Bible study going on and no growing and discussions of the things of God, you can wonder why things kind of go south. But if these things are established, the man is doing his job to sanctify the wife, the family. Uh, it says in verse 27 that he, meaning Jesus, might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, Think of that now in terms of if that is what Christ is doing for the church, he's sanctifying her and cleansing her, that he might present her, the church, to the Heavenly Father and say, this is my bride. Isn't she beautiful? So I want you to think about the moment where uh, you meet the parents. You're in a relationship, and one of you realizes this is getting serious, I think we're headed to marriage, and one of them says, well, you've got to meet my parents. Um, it, that's, that's a moment where you're going out of sight of, well, I, just, I want to get married to you, not to your family. No, sorry, that's not how this works. Jesus is saying I, he's going to present the church to the, the Heavenly Father. You, you gentlemen need to present your wife to the, to the family. You need to say that this is, I'm not embarrassed of her. I am proud of her. We're working together on a great marriage. I'm making sure that she's spotless, theologically speaking, uh, without blemish in her life, spiritually speaking. I'm going to do everything I can to edify her and build her up 
and make sure that she's a woman of God. And when, when you're able to present, even to the family on both sides, um, to say to my father-in-law, hey, I met Tammy in one condition, but as you watch our marriage, she's going to be a better and better woman for it. And I, I want to be able to say to Tommy, I, I hope Tammy is better and better and better every year that we are married. Does that make sense? Uh, and so when he comes to me and says, hey, favorite son-in-law, <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm, I'm doing it. So, I mean, to be fair, there's only one other southern son-in-law. So, <laughs> But th the point is, is I look to him to say, am I doing my job? Am I doing my job right? I I is, my, is your daughter, my wife, in a better condition spiritually, physically, emotionally than when she was without me? And I, 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 I take that as a responsibility of mine to guard her life, to protect her life, that when she doesn't feel well, I'm there to make sure that she has everything that she needs to feel better, stronger. Uh, we have made a decision as a family to eat as clean as possible, to be as healthy as possible, to work out when we can. And we count chasing children and beating children as part of the workout. Um, <laughs> um, but all of the child, all of the thing, we're doing this thing as a team. And it's not like, you do it. Um, I know in some households, like, guys never touch diapers. Look, we threw that out the window a long time ago. I'll get in there with a ski mask and <laughs> snorkel gear. I'll do whatever I can. We're, we're in this thing together. And uh, seriously, I've gotten past all of that. Like, I can, I can do almost anything. <laughs> um, seriously. My kids have shown me injuries over the span of their life. I'm like, oh my God, you should see a doctor. But um, the point is, I'm dad and I'm all in and I want to present not only my wife, but my family to say, hey, we did right. Does that mean that all of their behaviors are awesome and godly? No. No, I, have to, I still have to correct my older kids. I about did so in front of Marcia today. <laughs> My little magenta got a little sassy in front of Marsha and I today. I went, You're not too old <laughs> to get a whooping, kid. But uh, anyway, what am I saying? My job, God's job through Christ is to present the bride of Christ spotless, blameless, blemishlessness before the God of all creation. Verse 28, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. There, to me, there's a lot more instructions to the husbands, ladies, up to this point. Ladies, all you had was submit. He's going on and on and on to the husbands. We've got a lot of work. We've got a lot of work to do, uh, gentlemen, and we're, we're uh, tending not only to our own bodies, but we make sure that their body is nourished. We make sure that everyone in the household is nourished, and I love the word cherished. It is not a word that we use very often, except usually in the, the nuptials on wedding day, to love, honor, cherish, uh, the, that language comes out of this passage. But I don't think people really know what cherish means outside of stuff. Like, I, I have known some people that, you know, own classic cars, and no one's allowed to breathe on it. Um, no one's allowed to even get in it or touch it. It's in their garage, and it's underneath, you know, uh, uh, a guard of some sort. And uh, if you dare even peek under there to look at the color, your hand could get shot, your fingers. I mean, what, what are they saying? I cherish this item. But what if we took it one step further and husbands actually cherished their wives like that? Do you think it would be real easy for a wife to submit to her husband if he cherished her like that? But, you know... Unfortunately, a lot of guys run their wife down in front of other people, 
uh, both with the wife there and when she's not there. And he's, he's saying when, when he does that, I don't cherish her. I really don't, I don't think much of her. Um, she's basically garbage to me and I, I can just run her down whenever. Scriptures are saying otherwise. He's saying here, Jesus cherishes us. Uh, other, other passages say he's jealous for us. Uh, that song, um, he is jealous for me, loves like a hurricane. Yeah. So if you, you start to see, all right, he's jealous for me. He wants me in heaven more than I want to be there. He wants me there. More than I want to be there. Isn't that awesome? And he'll do anything he can to get our attention and protect us and nourish us and cherish us that we would be with him for an eternity. And then he looks at the husband and says, that's your job. Protect her. She's my daughter. I, I, we used to joke around at Bible college all the time. One of the guys would get a date with one of the girls at Bible college and we'd say to him, hey, where are you taking God's daughter tonight? That changes everything. When you hear that in your ear, hey, where are you taking God's daughter tonight? Does he know, that, does he know where you're taking her? You know, because the guys had some nasty plans in their mind of what they were going to do and how they were going to get it done. And, and uh, hey, that's, you know, that's God's daughter, right? You're going to cherish her. You're going to nourish her. You're going to protect her. And, you know, if you don't, we're going to be back here at campus ready to, we're, we'll be ready to take care of business on our end because we're, we're her brother, <laughs> right? Are we making sense? So uh, here we go. Verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So if that's not the picture of unity, I don't, want, I don't know what is. Um, they say that uh, a lot of couples that are together over a long period of time start to look very similar, conduct their lives very similarly. Uh, I know you're looking at them like, do I look like that? <laughs> but um, mannerisms start to get copied, ways of talking start to get copied. Um, it's almost like when you're, you're talking to one, you're talking to the other. Right? It's just like they are the same, they're the same, they're, they're the same. And that's what God wants. Over time, uh, you're, you're able to finish each other's sandwiches, like that movie <laughs> says. Right? You're able to, to, they're the same person. She, she's just in feminine form and he's in masculine form. They're the same. And we square up our kids all the time because they try to triangulate us. That is to say... Um, Johnny will come and ask me something, and if I tell him no, he's going over to mom to see if he can get a yes, right? But we know that game. We're not new to this child-rearing thing. So she just simply yells across the room, what did you tell Johnny? Oh, no, <laughs> right? And it's done. It's settled. We don't have an argument. I think he should. I think he shouldn't. If it's no, it's no. We can talk out the rationale and reason later. But right now, in front of the kids, we're one. We're in one accord, and we'll, uh, if we disagree, we'll do that later. Am I making sense? So that, that's what the world is supposed to see in Christian marriages, especially. They see the unity of Christ in the middle of the marriage and say, they got their stuff together. They're on the same team. They speak the same. They have the same counsel. They might come at it a little bit differently. So... Uh, my wife and I do a lot of counseling in our lives. Uh, almost every teacher that works here at the preschool comes crying to Tammy at some point about their life, right? And, and she gives them counsel. And she will do it the way that a woman would. Now, now, now if they come to me, there ain't none of that. There ain't no blankets or pillows or any of that involved in this little cry session. It's not happening that way. I come at it from the perspective of a dad, from the perspective of, of a man, and I make them look me in the eye. Here's what you need to do. And then they go to Tammy and cry. <laughs> because, but we're, actually, we're saying the same thing. It's just how can they hear it? 
If they can hear it from me, fine. If not, they're going to have to hear it from Tammy a bit differently. But we're always saying the same thing. And that's what Christ wants out of us. We're not giving people uh, mixed signals. We're saying the same thing at all times. It says here, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Bottom line, you want to see a successful marriage, you want to see successful relationships, it's built on the concept of verse 33. Guys, we have to learn how to figure out the language of love. It is foreign to us. And women, you have to learn the language of respect. And indeed, it is foreign to you. It's like learning a new language. But once you learn it, uh, if you've ever watched Eddie in operation, he's multilingual. If you ever watch him speak to someone that walks through the door that is of a different ethnicity, he always shocks them by speaking their language to them. Um, and oh, didn't we have an Italian guy here, Eddie, that, I mean, right away, Eddie starts speaking Italian to him, and he was like, no one ever speaks to me in Italian, like, how did this happen? But you can impress someone if you know their language and, and speak it to them. How much more so when it comes to relationship? I've studied your creature, I know what they are, and I know how to speak to them, Right? You're going to go a lot further than someone that doesn't know how to speak, number one, to a woman. If a guy doesn't know how to speak to her, the, the words are going to come out, get away from me, creep, <laughs> right? But if, you, if, you, if, if he can learn how to speak, she will be more inclined to listen. And, and notice that none of this was based on hormones. None of this was based on attraction. Um. In this culture, marriages were arranged. It was contractual between families. So attraction wasn't even the deal for a successful marriage. So if you come along the lines of if he were just a little bit cuter or she were just a little bit more beautiful or if she did her makeup once in a while, it's, that's not even part of the discussion. A marriage is not built on the exterior because if you've ever read the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, you will learn that beauty fades and is only temporary. After a while, the young stud that you fell in love with is going to have a beer belly and, a, <laughs> and, and be balding, right? I mean, that's a, re a reality. And so... As you go through through life, he's not going to look the same, and neither are you. No matter how much Botox you take in, you're never going to be 19 again, Shelby. This is it. <laughs> you're 19 once, and that's it. You enjoy it. One day in your late 20s, you're going to look in the mirror and say, when did this gray hair, when did this get here? Claire, all number 56 will aid you only for so long. But the, the point being, we, we all grow old, and if you go only off the, 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 the level of beauty, exterior beauty, you'll never build a good relationship. You go off of these foundations, long into your golden years, you'll still love the person you fell in love with as a young person. Amen? Amen. You know, back in verse 31, we, we see the notion of um, leaving your mother and father and joining you leave and you cleave. You yeah. leave your mother and father and you cleave to your husband and your wife. Yeah. And, you know, I've given away two daughters in marriage. And we've had discussions. That's been hard for me because I would tell them, and I said, you know, this is difficult because when you say I do, I no longer am the most important man in your life. Yeah. He is. Yeah. And don't try to triangulate and drag me into this relationship. I don't want to be in it. You know, Steph and I have, we have purpose. We are not going to meddle in our kids' lives. We're not going to be those. And, and, and if you're having, you know, oh, I'm going to, you know, you know, insert myself into your marriage. You know, we're, we're not going to do that. We're going to let them do their stuff. But I know as a dad, have you given daughters away in marriage? Not yet. They're still all in the dating phase, yeah. So but When you go from being the most important man in your life to giving that up to somebody else, yeah. man, that's, all, that's been the hardest part for me. But it's important. 
even in dating, I've, I've watched my daughters kind of give me the stiff arm like, oh, okay, you don't need me, all right. And, and, and my daughters know now that once they get married, you know, I'm not their catch, I'm not the catch net. You know, you work it out with your husband. He's the most important man. You're, it's you two. Yeah. I'm out of the picture. Yeah. I'm not, you don't go running home to mommy and daddy. Yeah. Because that's... And that's, that's got to be a discipline on every level. It's got to be on their side and on, on the parental side. It's got to be on both. Because if someone caves in and says, oh, well, let's, let's cater to this. Well, it's not going to work. The leave and cleave has to, has to occur. That's right out of the book of Genesis, by the way. That was a quote out of Genesis when man was created and the wife out of, <laughs> excuse me, out of his side. That was, that was the instructions that came with it. So uh, next week we get to pick on children because the first opening line of Ephesians 6.1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. That is letter C when I memorize the alphabet as a kindergartner. <laughs> Right? Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. So I've known my whole life they're in charge. I'm not. My job is to listen to what parents say. And it is a fine line. When does the, the child-parent relationship end? When does that tent of covering leave and now they are obedient or submissive to someone else? Because there are a lot of parents that will say, I'm still their parent even though you're married and living in another house. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> the moment that they agreed in marriage, they're not under your umbrella anymore. They're a part of your family, and they can come over for Thanksgiving and Christmas and so on and so forth. But we're not paying their bills and doing all this. No, this is over. Make sense? Yeah. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the power of your word. I pray that this was highly instructive. I pray that there will be many successful relationships that bloom out of this teaching and that we will count on your word to lead us in the right way in everything, even as it relates to relationships. You've written on it, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.